Welcome back to So Very Wrong About Games. My name is Mike Walker, and I'm here with my good friend, Mark Bigney. How are you today, Mark? I'm quite well, Walker. How are you? This is a podcast about board games and everything to do with about board games. First thing we're going to do is talk about games we played this week, the news, and why it doesn't matter, our feature game, which is Giant Killer Robots, and our topic of the week, which is blinging out your game. But first, board game philosophy brought into the real life. Sometimes when I'm playing board games, I like to criticize the wording and start a discussion. But my fellow players don't normally pick up on this, and they think it's some sort of argument. And we get into a heated discussion, and usually I'm doing it out of jest or fun, just to bring out the bad wording. But it turns into an argument, and I think this needs to be brought into the real life. I think in the big topics of the day, it becomes very polarized very quickly, and it usually turns into two sides screaming at each other. And I think we, we really need to start having discussions again, as opposed to arguments. That is Mike Walker's board game philosophy of the day. It doesn't help, Walker, that you always call it rules lawyering, and it's always about some ability or card that you have and how it should let you do something awesome. Never looking over the table at somebody else's ability or card and saying that they should be able to do something awesome. That's because I'm always losing, Mark. Fair enough. All right, now on to the games we played this week. What did you play this week, Mark? This week I played Not Alone. Not Alone was by Gisele Masson and put up by Stronghold a couple of years ago. And I this is my first play with the expansion called Exploration. We didn't try too much of the new Exploration stuff, but what we did use was very neat. Not Alone is a large player 1v all game, but not 1v all in the sense of an overlord controlling minis or anything. This is sort of a double guessing game where there's an alien hunting humans. The alien tries to guess where humans are going to go, and then humans secretly decide where they're going to go, and they try not to get caught. I say try because whenever I'm a human, I seem to get caught roughly every turn, sometimes three times. I don't know how that works. And uh, suffice to say, I'm usually pretty bad, and the rest of my team starts yelling at me. But I still enjoy the game. It's quick, it's simple, it's approachable. It's probably my favorite of the of the sort of hidden movement games. It doesn't have any of the complexities of hidden movement that you might have in, say, a Spectre Ops or Letters from Whitechapel, stuff like that. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really good. It's a great filler, and it supports large numbers of people, and the new stuff is good. I've always enjoyed Not Alone. Well, you say you get caught a lot. Maybe you should start playing your cards face down, Mark. What I played this week is Quartermaster General 1914. We all love it here at So Very Wrong About Games. I own the Quartermaster General for World War II, and this is the one about World War I. The difference here is that you get to play two cards. It's one of these guys on a map game that plays very much like a Euro, because you normally only have one troop per territory. So it's very easy to see how it's going to play out, and it's more about deck ha- hand management and deck management than it is about, you know, destroying troops and so forth. All the games of the series, I think, have been winners. They're marvels of simplicity, but at the same time, they managed to cram a large degree of historicity into the game, which is really a tribute. Uh, I had the pleasure of talking with Ian Brody uh, a couple times at uh, Gen Con when I went, and he's a very impressive guy, and he comes from a long war game pedigree, but this really is sort of a war game for Euro gamers. The World War One version is really interesting also because of the asymmetry of the two sides. It, all of the games are team games. And this game is a five-player game. You should probably only play with five. And it's two versus three. And I've seen a number of other games, like the 1812 game, try to do this, and it didn't really work well. The balance was off, and it felt wonky. It works really well in Quartermaster General 1914, and so I've been very, very impressed. I like all of them, but 1914 is probably my favorite, partially because it opens up the tempo a little bit. All of these games are very, very deliberative. You generally only do one thing on your turn. But 1914 gives you a little bit more flexibility and a lot of that. It is, of course, also the most complex of the three games released thus far. Uh, Victory of Death was the one about the Peloponnesian Wars, and indeed the first one, which was simply called Quartermaster General, was indeed about World War II. Another virtue, one final virtue that 1914 has over the other systems, I think, is in some of the other games, it's frequently the case that you pick on a single player and cause them to exhaust their deck. And in 1914, very, very much in keeping with the theme, most everyone is just exhausted by the end of the game. The, their decks have just been wrecked. Everyone let, let loose an orgiastic display of violence at the beginning of the game, but then by the end you're just entrenched and there's, it feels impossible to get any progress. And some people might find that frustrating, but at least everyone at the table is feeling that same level of frustration. And that, that helps to both convey the theme and keep everybody on the same page. So I thoroughly recommend all the Quartermaster General games, but I think 1914 really is the apex of the series thus far. Agreed. What else did you play this week? We played Mythic Battles Pantheon, and just to follow up on a discussion that we had last week about multiplayer conflict games, we weren't really talking about skirmish-type games like Mythic Battles, but nonetheless it has the same problem. 
I wasn't very optimistic about playing it multiplayer, and indeed we played Mythic Battles with three players, and it worked out more or less how one might fear. It was a, a very sort of borderline king situation where there was player elimination, and that's just not awesome. It was the situation, just to give a little bit of detail, where Walker was just about to win through one of the, the two victory conditions, and the only way to stop him was to, you know, assassinate his god and knock him out of the game. So we had to do that. And then it was a two-player game. So not hot with three players. I don't think I'd do it again. I still really like the game with two players. The different victory conditions, the way the units work, the way the drafting works, it's all good stuff. But it just doesn't seem to do anything to really get out of that three-player trap that a lot of this game, a lot of these types of games fall into. Some people had commented that they felt that it worked really well multiplayer, but I don't know what they're talking about. My experiences have not been that. So I still recommend the game, but... If you're going to play multiplayer, probably the only way to do it, I think, is four players with teams. True. The argument can be made that, you know, I blew ahead very quickly and therefore made myself a target. But I think that falls back on how you make your army. I made my army to be fast and to do that, right? So if you're going to play that you have to, you know, slowly build up so you don't become a target, then that's really going to limit you on how you build your army, I think. Yeah, and any game where proper play or or bold play can lead to that kind of dynamic that's not good. I mean, you made a series of very wise tactical decisions. You play, you played a high-risk, high-reward strategy where you wanted to go snap up all the resources on the map and win that way. And then, therefore, our proper response, the other two players at the table, our proper strategic decision was to kill you and eliminate you from the game. And so that was just a, a situation where we had a degenerate game state because everyone was making good decisions. And I don't like that in a design. So relegated strictly to two-player or teams, I think. But still, I, I still really like Mythic Battles. All right, this week I pulled out an oldie but a goodie. It's called Formula Day or Formula D. It's a racing game, and we just did one lap, but this is sort of like a foreshadowing thing. I'm going to bring it up later. It really shows its age, but for what it is, it does a really good job. I've played many racing games, and I really think that this hits all the points it needs to. It makes you feel like you're in the race. It's a risk-reward game where you're rolling a whole bunch of different series of dice that represent your gears, and they don't have normal numbers on them. They all range in different numbers, and they're the spaces you're going to move, and you have to assure that you stop in the corners. So you might blow through the corners because you've decided to roll the wrong die and therefore crash. So it's sort of like a, you know, press-your-luck type of game, and I think it does a very good job. What is it with race games taking too long? I don't understand. So many of the race games that I've played, even if I liked the, the underlying systems, they just played far, far, far too long, which seems like an especially egregious sin, given that it is a race game. Well, I think in race games, the problem is is that they want to have this feeling of come from behind. And I think if the game ends too quickly, you don't give them the opportunity to have this, you know, photo finish at the end where, you know, oh my God, he was in last place and he zipped to the end at the very, you know, at the very end or a chance to catch up. Let's say if you make a mistake, if you make a racing game too short, then there were no chance to catch up. Yeah, the only race games that I've really liked are actually just betting games. Winner's Circle, for example, I, I thoroughly enjoy, but it's not a racing game. It's a betting game about a race. That's right. You don't actually control how fast they're going. You just sort of have to gauge, you know, who you think is going to win type thing. Yeah, it's less about actually getting the, the, the horsies across the finish line and more about betting which one will. And the race games that I have liked, Magical Athlete, I quite enjoyed even though it was stupid, but it took too long. Uh, Renner Knizia did a, a no-luck racing game about chariots, and it even it took too long, and Knizia had Kinetic games don't normally fall victim to that. And every time I played Formula Day, I, there's a lot of clever stuff. I like the, I like, I mean, the bits are very nice. That doesn't hurt. And I like the fact that there are multiple real world, tr real, real world tracks and all that. But it's just, oh, it always seems to take too long. It really does, it, especially in compared to modern design. I think back in the day, it did not feel that way. But compared to modern design, it is a much too long game. Yeah, so back when you were playing with your dinosaur friends, I'm sure it... it That's it right, back fine. when we were scratching in the dirt, yeah, yeah. It, it seemed a lot longer. So we had the opportunity to play two great Eric Lang games more or less back-to-back -back on successive days. Uh, we played Rising Sun, and then the very next day we played Blood Rage. And so this, I think, is a good opportunity to just spend a little bit of time sort of squaring the circle, connecting some of the comments we've made before, because we did a full review on Rising Sun. I think for what it's worth, both of our opinions still stand. We still both appreciate it for what it is. I think you're a little more positive on it than I am. And just to make a very pointed question, so between Rising Sun and Blood Rage Walker, which, which of the two is your favorite design? I think it still is Rising Sun. Even though we played them both together, our Rising Sun game was a bit skewed in my mind. We had sort of like a wild horse. I was making fairly random decisions that were very hard to anticipate and were questionable, right? Which led to weird circumstances, in my opinion. And you had made a comment in the last show that you thought you could, in Blood Rage, that you could change your strategy easier than 
rising sun, but I felt it was the opposite. I thought that I could quickly change my strategy because you know what victory point cards are coming at the end. So you can quickly just flip to the other one and hopefully pick up what victory points you can. Whereas I feel in blood rage, you have no control over how the cards are being dealt. And then as they're being drafted, you have no idea if the cards are going to meet or are going to get to you, right? So you can think, you know which cards are in the deck. You say, okay, this is the one that's going to get me the most victory points. This is my second choice, but you might not even see either of those cards. So I am re- I really feel that the flow of Rising Sun is much better. That's interesting. I, I still feel the opposite way because to a certain extent in Rising Sun, when I've purchased my first Virtue card, sometimes I feel like I'm locked in for the rest of the game. Or if you look at the different end game victory conditions, they really do mean you have to slowly build up over the course of the game. If you're behind the eight ball, if you don't have a, a, a stronghold out in the first round and you really need one, some factions don't need them, some factions do. If you don't have enough opportunities to grab virtue cards or the ones you bought were bought, then that's it. I mean, at the end of the day, I think the reason why I prefer Blood Rage, additionally, in addition to, to my perceived ability to, to pivot more easily in subsequent ages, is precisely because... When looking at your available hand of mandates in Rising Sun, very often I'm in a position where none of these seem appealing to me. Now, maybe this is sometimes my own fault. Maybe it isn't. But whether it is or it isn't, I look at them and say, well, none of these particularly help me. None of these particularly do a very good job. That's not even a case that sometimes in in games it's always about choosing the least worst option. I don't even get that sense in Rising Sun. I just look at them and say, none of these. I I really can't do with any of these because my board position is just shot. Sometimes I'm even winning. And I feel that way. It's like, eh, none of these really matter. And those are not fun choices to make for me. Well, that could be a part where we were talking about how diplomacy is not in Rising Sun like they, like they want to be. Maybe that is a place where you can bring in diplomacy, where you can facade that these are all are important and sort of maybe, you know, auction off, you know, one of the choices to someone and make some money and deplete them of some money at the same time. Sure, I don't want to get rehash again all the the, no. the reasons why resources are so tight and so the diplomacy is limited. But anyway, setting all that aside, I just when playing Blood Rage and I look at my hand of cards, even if none of them are the ones that I particularly want, I am able to think about how I might be able to use some of them. So I'm always able to to, to get to a position where I feel good about taking a card rather than like many of my decisions in, in Rising Sun, I don't feel good about any of them. But I do feel Blood Rage is slightly more open, slightly more permissive, slightly more forgiving, slightly more flexible. And at the end of the day, that, that's why I prefer it. But make no mistake, they are very, very similar games. Even though mechanically they don't share, share a heck of a lot in common, one's a drafting game, one's a role selection game, we're talking about a game where you play three ages, where there's fighting, but fighting is not necessarily the way to get points. Sometimes you want to lose fights to get points, and you are going to be crafting your own unique set of special powers. So they're very, very similar. I could easily imagine for many people they don't need both in their collection that makes perfect sense and indeed if uh, i got rid of rising sun i think i'd probably be reasonably happy with with blood rage very often after playing rising sun i feel like i wish i'd played blood rage not to say that i'm disappointed having played it but and that's why i make the comparison not just because they were done by the same designer all right now we're going to talk about the city of kings the city of kings was put out this year by frank west and the company is the city of games so obviously there's some relation there and I went into it with no expectations. In fact, I, I went into it with relatively low expectations by virtue of the fact that it just seemed like another pedestrian Euro kind of walk around the world, collect things kind of thing. And in terms of fantasy adventure games, I've done this a number of times and I tend to find them relatively dry and unengaging. I'm thinking of games like Prophecy. I'm thinking of games like Return of the Heroes or even just the more classic Ameritrashy versions like Talisman or even Arkham Horror or stuff like that. And it just, uh, they don't, they don't tend to grab me, especially since games like Mage Knight came out and showed you how you can really do it well and interestingly. And the City of Kings didn't seem to do anything particularly interestingly. But in actually playing the game, I was very, very, very pleasantly surprised at how engaging and fun I found the game to be. Part of this, I think, is it does a reasonably good job of selling the theme in terms of judicious use of flavor text, which is to say very little, and very well-realized art. It also does a very interesting things with enemies. Uh, I saw this before in a game called Shadows of Malice by Jim Felly which does an excellent job of producing random enemies that are still very flavorful, you do have to put in a little bit of work. You do have to try to spend some time with your suspension of disbelief and trying to you know, imagine what the monsters are like and, and imbue them with a little, little bit of personality. But the mechanics are there to give them that personality. And the City of Kings does something slightly different as the stack of tiles as you kill more enemies you get deeper into the stack and their abilities change and get stronger not just stronger though they get different you know one might have good armor one might have good counterattacks etc and on top of this you every enemy gets random 
special abilities. And that really changes how they act on the map. At any rate, it encourages you to remain flexible and improve your character in different ways to to meet the challenges that you're facing. It's got this weird sort of grafted on Euro element to it where you're managing workers that are collecting resources. And honestly, thematically, it's a bit of a hash, but mechanically, it's relatively satisfying. So I'm looking forward to trying more stories. We only played one one story so far, which is uh, f- five chapters in the in the story. The, the chapter setup also helped break it up very nicely. It's like, go do this thing. Now to go do this thing. Now go do this other thing. And it led to a nice evolution over the session. So I was very pleasantly surprised. Nothing earth-shattering, I don't think. But I am looking forward to my subsequent plays. I, I agree with all those points. And looking forward to it is something as I always look forward to the next game. But it's been a very long time since I've looked forward to a particular game. I very seldom pick what game to play when someone asks. But... City of Kings is will be will be my first choice next time for sure. And like Mark said with the story and the chapters, I'll only talk about that one element and I think it's really interesting how they have they set up the whole tile map at the beginning and as you go into the next chapter, you don't need to change anything. It just sort of adds adds a a new element to the game and it really feels as though it's changed up even though it's exactly the same map so it's not like a descent where you have to change the whole map or move stuff around so there's no time wasted you're on to the next chapter and i'm really looking forward to the next play it is a very clean euro tactical puzzle that nonetheless manages to feel like an adventure game and that that is a circle that people have been trying to square for a while and i think the city of kings has done a very good job with it all right and now on to the news and why it does not matter all right i'm going to talk about the big game this week Came onto Kickstarter, a giant plastic monstrosity with marble sliding across the plastic. It's Mousetrap, deluxified. No, it's not. It is Fireball Island. And I'm going to put on my Cremungeon Destroyer of Fun hat and say, what the hell? Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I really feel, I know a lot of people are, are pledging on this and I don't know, I'm not sure what they're expecting. I, I've looked into it. And I, I just feel as though they're going to pull it out of the box, watch the marbles, you know, flow down a couple times, and you're going to lose interest very quickly. I, I do not think there is a game here. I think it's very appealing to the eye. I think it's a very nostalgic thing. And I, I'm just hoping people are going into it knowing this. That's all. I think the shine is off Rob Davio. I've said this before. He's spearheading the redesign on this. He's done some very good work. He invented the legacy concept for good or ill, but it was certainly a very clever innovation. He did a lot of great work on HeroScape, but that actually leads to to my point. If I want to play with a giant toy, I'm going to play a miniatures game. And there's tons of really, really fun ways to, to implicate toys there. Farbile Island, the original design had, I think, asymptotically approaching zero choices anywhere. It was more or less just an evolution of roll and move and you know pulling random cards. I assume Rob Davio is going to try to dress it up. Who knows? Maybe it'll maybe something good will come out the other end. I I remain skeptical, not not quite as scornful as you are, but I do think that a number of people are mostly being mod- motivated by nostalgia on this one. True. I don't want to belittle anyone, but I think if you have children or as a gateway game, it'll be fantastic. But other than that, I think it'll be a great centerpiece for your collection. He doesn't want to belittle anyone, but if you like it, you're a baby. This is good for little babies. <laughs> If you're like a baby, maybe you should get your baby game and play with it, baby. <laughs> Not that he wants to belittle anyone, babies. <laughs> Harsh. What I know, you? I know, but I wasn't the one who said it. I think you just did. What do you got on your news segment there? On the topic of nostalgia, I have said before, I am an unrepentant Macross fan. I'm a huge, huge fan of everything Macross. And there are going to be new Robotech games. Now, Robotech is indeed the ugly stepsister of Macross, and that's fine. But I can still look at a card that says Rick Hunter and imagine that it says Hikaru Uchijo, and that's fine. I can deal with that. That that That's on me. And there's going to be a game called uh, Robotech Ace Pilot in June. I saw a video demo of it where it looked like a very, very simple game that normally I wouldn't be interested in. But then at one point, a member of the demo team said, and you know, if you buy the Misa Hayase card, it synergizes very, very well with the Hikaru Uchijo card, which makes sense because if you know the show. And I'm like, yeah, I'm sold. However much money these people want, I will give it to them even if there's no game. So... <laughs> <laughs> They're going to be able to get a number of games with the Robotech license. I will probably get all of them. And if anybody online wants to make mock-ups with the appropriate uh, UN Spacey Japanese names, that would be great. So yes, I have no shame. All right, what I've got is a game from AEG, Mystic Veil Conclave. It's in the same vein as 
the Smash Up Geek Box. It's going to be a giant, massive veil box where you can fit all the expansions. And uh, some new tokens, mechanics. Unfortunately, it's my feeling that usually more players is bad. Mystic Veil plays with four, and with this new box, it's going to go up to six. So they've introduced new mechanics, much like Eclipse, where there's two turn markers going around the table. You'll have two people taking their turn at the same time. And this sort of leads to my my hatred of, not hatred, but I feel sometimes in, in Robo Rally or Space Alert, when people are flipping over their cards, in their mind's eye, they they want to do a certain action or they think they've played a certain action, so they're not looking at the cards and they just go through their program line, much like Mystic Veil. Vale, you think you've, you have this much mana or you think your cards can do certain things where they just cannot, and it just leads to you know, bad game states. Join us next week when we'll be talking about Asmodee acquiring another company and Walker talking about another Mystic Veil vale expansion. Yes, Walker's weekly Mystic Veil vale plug. The, another game that I'm looking forward to is Confrontation Resurrection. So in the 90s, there was this company called Rackham, and they put out, arguably at the time, the best miniatures on the market. They definitely had things down in terms of sculpting and manufacturing, and they made the GW stuff at the time look positively uh, medieval in comparison. And it was married to a reasonably clever skirmish-level minis game called Confrontation. A number of things happened. They tried to move into pre-painted plastics, and that didn't work out so well. And the company died, but the Confrontation line is being brought back. And in April, there's going to be a Kickstarter with a, quite frankly, perhaps irrationally huge starter box. This isn't going to be the, the classic minis game setup where you buy a starter box and it gives you a faction. But this is intended primarily for fans, I think, who want to get a, a sort of dose of, of the old times. One taste of the old times makes everything right again. And so this is going to be a 16 faction, 178 miniatures box. They are probably going to ask for $17,000. And uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to pony up for that much. I, I did love Confrontation. The old rule set, the 3.5 edition rule set, was very good and interesting. And I'd be very interested in trying that again. And a lot of the faction lore really appealed to me. It wasn't Tolkien-esque fantasy. It was a slight elaboration on things. And I found it really engaging. And a lot of the designs were really cool. So I've got a lot of enthusiasm for Confrontation. I don't know if this resurrection package is going to be for me necessarily. But... If you're at all interested, parenthetically, there's a you, if you shoot them an email, there's no requirement that you buy anything with this. If you just shoot them an email to sort of, they say reserve your pledge, but it's not a deposit or anything. They'll give you three extra minis uh, with your pledge, old Rackham sculpts that were never released. So there's a lot of nostalgia going around in the news section today. So Confrontation Resurrection is going to be hitting Kickstarter on the 17th of April, and I'm going to be looking forward to that. All right, just two last quick announcements. There's, if you're interested in... Race for the Galaxy or Claustrophobia, there's been second editions announced for both those games. Claustrophobia 1643. Talk more about that when I think there are more details to emerge. I'm cautiously optimistic because Claustrophobia is amazing, but some of the some of the proposed or expected slash inevitable changes that Kickstarter will reach, I probably will not I probably I think will probably not do the game any favors, but time will tell. Alright, our feature game this week is Giant Killer Robots. So Giant Killer Robots, or GKR as it's abbreviated, Heavy Hitters, was designed by Matt Hyra and put out by Cryptozoic and Weta Workshop of this year. Cryptozoic and Matt Hyra have put out many games. Most of them are licensed deck builders. If you have a license that you want to churn out a you know reasonably pedestrian but nonetheless functional and diverting deck builder, Matt Hyra is your guy. He's done a lot of that. He's also He was also one of the designers of the World of Warcraft miniatures game, which I mention only because at the time it did a number of very clever things for a minis game that I haven't seen repeated since. It used a time system not entirely unlike the game Thebes, whereby every action costs a certain amount of time and then the unit acts again when, it's, when they're on a, a sort of a clock queue. I liked it. It was good. Anyway, a number of people when playing GKR Heavy Hitters ask if this is adapted from something, a movie, a video game, a comic, or whatever, because it definitely feels like that. And the answer is no, it's not. It, they're trying to make their own universe here. Cryptozoic and Weta are basically made their own sort of setting, and it's relatively well realized. The art is uh, very characteristic. It looks a lot like Borderlands. It's got that cel-shaded effect. And what a workshop is trying to make its way into this universe because they've been making props and practical visual effects for movies and television for quite some time. They worked on Avatar, they worked on The Lord of the Rings, stuff like that. And it's definitely evident in the production. So this is an original IP. Who knows if there are going to be other games that come out later, but this is their their 
initial offering. And this is a game about, as you might imagine, giant killer robots blasting the ever-loving hell out of them. And so let's indeed start with the components, because I think it's worth talking about. We don't normally stress components, certainly not first off in this podcast, but for this game, I think it's worth it. In the game, the four heavy hitters are these pre-painted, very large, giant killer robots. And they're not even just pre-painted. They have these very cool sort of, they almost look like water slide decals, but they're actually painted onto the minis, of logos or numbers or cool graphic effects around the barrels of guns. And when the game is set up, and setup doesn't take too long, which is somewhat unusual for, for, for minis games these days, it's got these very nice buildings made out of cardboard and plastic bases. And so for very little setup, you get a very impressive looking battlescape right away. Yeah, it looks fantastic for sure. And even the other giant killer robots, the so-called support units, there are only, well, only, there's a total of 16 minis in the base game. Four, four heavy hitters, as they're called, and then three more support units for each faction, of which there are four factions. And they are not pre-painted, but they do come pre-shaded, so the level of detail is still quite nice. And I will would also like to stress that the design of the units is quite well done. This isn't your traditional sort of Gundam or even Macross kind of humanoid giant robot. These are very oddly proportioned, not quite humanoid, extra robotic limbs sticking out, strange barrel torsos, absent head kind of things. Anyway, I'm, I, as, a, as a big fan of giant robots and even of the traditional giant robot design, I found it quite visually striking. And when it's set up and when you see all the pieces laid out, it really is very well executed, both in terms of just the, the quality of the component design, but also in terms of the quality of the visual design and in turn selling the universe that they're trying to put out. The miniatures really made me feel like the Battletech pre-paints that came out recently, like more like the farming and construction type mechs. More than, you know, the zip around fighty mechs. And we didn't even talk about the player boards that are really interesting as well. Nice hard plastic functional player boards. Very nice touch as well. Those, unfortunately, though, are Kickstarter exclusive. Oh, that is unfortunate. So what do you do in Giant Killer Robots? What do you do in Giant Killer Robots? In what giant... do you do and what do you do them with? Do you perhaps kill with Giant Robots? You do. You destroy. And... So the first thing you have to do is build your giant killer robot. So your heavy hitter, you're going to build your deck of 25 cards. You're going to choose your giant weapon, which consult, which consists of five of the cards, and then two support weapons, which are four cards each. Four cards each. For that's a total of 13 cards of your 25 card deck. And the rest of the cards are made up of defense cards and orbital strikes and other cards of your choice. So once you have your 25 card deck. You deploy your mechs, and then you're going to be spending energy to summon your support robots or outmaneuver your opponents, firing your weapons. And then there's two victory conditions. It's either blowing up four buildings or destroying your opponent's heavy hitter. And whoever reaches this first is the winner. So let's start by talking about this energy management, because I think it's probably my favorite part of the game. Every round, you start off with five energy. And every card you play that is a weapon card will cost some amount of energy. It's printed right there. If you deploy a support unit, which is very important, that's going to be very expensive. And every step you take with your heavy hitter also costs an energy. And you can go into the red. You can go into negative energy. But in so doing, you immediately take damage. And so it's a very risk-reward type of situation. You have to plan out or at least have some vision at the start of the round what you're going to be using your very limited energy for. And it's very simple. It's very straightforward, it's very intuitive, but it's immediately full of trade-offs, and it immediately forces you to not be able to do everything you want to. It makes every move consequential. This isn't the standard sort of uh, skirmishy type game where everyone has a movement allowance and you just move everything to the movement allowance and whatever, but instead, every step with your heavy hitter matters, and it might even cost you damage later in the game, or it might be an, a weapon you can't fire. I really liked the energy management aspect of the game. I agree. That was the best part of the game for me as well. I think it made it flow very very well trade-offs like you said and i think the designers agreed with you as well because the hard player boards that we talked about max out at five energy there's no way to get more energy they capped it off so there's no way for that to be manipulated and they knew it was the core part of the game and on top of that further emphasizing the need for mobility and how expensive it is in games like this, if there's no incentive to move, if they don't make um, maneuver important enough, they just tend to de degenerate into dice chucking slog fests. 
in Giant Killer Robots, one of the victory conditions, as you said, is to destroy buildings. And the only way you can do that is by getting your units adjacent to buildings. And as those buildings get destroyed, you have to move on to new ones. And so as a result, fighting over territory and trying to make sure that your your Giant Killer Robots are in the right place really matters. And your heavy hitter, which is the one that's that's most expensive to move, tags better and destroys buildings better than any other robot. And as so... Again, that's a further drain on your energy, and they did recognize the importance of maneuver, which I think is an absolute necessity for games like this. All right, let's move on. I really like how they made all the different factions. There's four factions of the game, and I think they made them all very distinct, even though all the leaders are the same, that you when you, you, put, you draw a leader at the beginning of the game and it's all from the same pool, there's still there's quite a few of them, and they're all very distinct, and, and the, I think the powers on the leaders are all fairly balanced. And the art on the cards are fantastic as well. So the customization is, I think, one of those things that where the game doesn't really reach its full potential. You know, you talked about how at the start of the game you build a deck. And in theory, this could allow for lots of customizability, lots of different builds, trying to be able to react to what your opponent has built and uh, outplay them in that way. But in practice, every time I've played, I've thought that that was going to happen, but it never really materialized. The attacks are more or less samey, and generally speaking, you just want to take ones that dish out the most damage possible, because the stats don't vary enough to gen- to offer a genuine plur- plurality of playstyles. Yes, some weapons are shorter range, whereas some re- weapons are longer range. Fine. Uh, but at the end of the day, they don't have enough character or personality. In terms of the art, they definitely do. It's absolutely neat, uh, neat what they're called and what they look like. But in terms of actual game effects, you don't really get any big surprises. It's not really easy to plan around it to to to, to really try to accommodate for your uh, uh, opponent's build. Most of the time, you're just gonna you know move to their flank, so you can't fire at them anyway. Uh, as opposed to really calculating, it's like, well, I know what their primary weapon is, and I will play to that weakness. This is unlike a game, for example, like Sakura Arms, which is all about customizing your deck and then reacting to what your opponent has. Part of it is just visual design. You know, maybe a good player aid that summarized all the different weapons might help a little bit, but then I think there'd be too much information. It might be a cumbersome player aid. But also, I just wish that the weapons had slightly, if they if their stats had as much personality as they did graphically. Yeah, I feel there's a little bit unbalanced too, you know, with the how much energy the weapons cost to fire, you know, cross reference with their ability and or how much damage they do. I think a little more tweaking can be done there for sure. Yeah, so some primary weapons do four damage and some primary weapons do as much as eight. And I really don't. I'm not an expert at the game by any means, but based on the playings that we've had, I don't really see a good reason to take a 4 damage primary weapon as opposed to a, an 8 damage primary weapon. Yeah, it'll cost more energy, and maybe the range band isn't quite as good, but, I mean, come on, it's twice as much damage, and uh, it's probably going to serve you better. There's also one attack, one card in particular that we ran across that certainly in two-player is incredibly abusive. It's called Coiled Strike, and it basically, uh, the way that it works is if you hit you get to play another Coiled Strike. And normally in this game, you can't play the same card more than once in a turn. So you only have one primary weapon, so you'll only be firing one primary weapon in a turn. Well, with Coiled Strike, you might play it five times, and that's more or less game. And, and the energy cost as well. No, you, know, you don't have to pay the energy, and you get to, so you get to break two rules with this one card. Yeah. Two of the main rules. It's true. And so uh, ultimately, uh, some, of, some of the cards, I'm not going to say they're worthless, but it just, it just undermines the customization of the game. It, it's, it's an okay feature. It doesn't take too long, and it's relatively simple. I just wish there was slightly more personality in terms of the weapons. All right, let's talk about some of the side mechanisms that are going on here. There is a mechani- uh, mechanic that is the sponsorship cards. We talked about tagging the buildings. At the end of the turn, if you have a giant killer robot beside a building, you will tag it, as in spray paint your logo on it. And once they have four of these tags, they blow up. That makes sense, right? That's how graffiti works. It, so it eats away at the load-bearing oh, struts. I See, I gotcha. We tell the truth. We t- see, I only understood that because my tinfoil hat wasn't on. Now... The number of buildings that you tag, the different buildings you tag, is going to represent how many of these sponsorship cards that you get to draw. And a lot of games do this for some reason, like Twilight Imperium, the action cards, or just throw in these random, nonsical, silly cards, and I feel as though they put them in to give balance back to the game. Maybe they feel, you know, if you're behind, you can play one of these cards and rebalance the game. I I don't understand why they put them in the game. But this is right in the same vein. These cards, you know, 
borderline ridiculous. I feel the same way. A number of game designs, otherwise solid games, get undercut by the the, the wild nonsense of random action card draws. Innis or Inish, I think, really, really suffered by virtue of having these one-shots enter the game. Uh, there was a worker placement game called Yedo, which was otherwise a solid worker placement game and had these incredible wild swings in terms of the deck constitution. In a game like this, that's relatively light and freewheeling, I don't object to one-shot cards necessarily, but they vary wildly and widely in terms of application. Some of them are situationally marginally helpful, and some of them are just always amazing. And uh, that, that, that's just too big of a swing. For example, there's one card that says you get one energy back when moving. Okay, fine. Energy's great, and I like anything that deals with the energy management, but one energy back when moving is, is a mild boost, and fine, that's good to have. But then there's another card that says after weapons have been declared, take one of the declared weapons and move it to the damage pile. So what this means is a weapon that somebody wanted to fire won't fire, even though they still had to pay for the energy, and now that card is out of their deck. So not only is their turn crippled, but their their future ability to use that weapon has been undermined. And it's just a no-brainer, and I don't like cards that are no-brainers. And it's got all the, the sort of lazy design elements of, you know, play this card to cancel some other card or play this card to steal a card from another player or what have you. They're not, they're not interesting. They're not well done. They're not particularly fun to be the victim of random nonsense. And so I see what they were going for. And in a game like this, it could have been fine, but I don't think they did a very good job with it. And the game takes way too long. Yeah, for a game like this, if if Giant Killer Robots were reliably 45 to 60 minutes at, across player counts, I'd feel a lot more positively about the game than I do. And so th- this, this, I think, actually is a good way to sum up where I am right now. I've talked about the things that I like, but the game has a little more rules grit than I'd like. So there's spotting, there's alley shots, there's the line of sight arcs. There are two different line of sight arcs in this game based on, on what you're doing. And it just... <sighs> Even experienced gamers are going to have a couple questions run up. And for a game with this light decision-making and with the wildness of the one-shot cards and the imbalance of the other cards and all that other stuff going on, if it were 45 to 60 minutes, I'd feel a lot more positively about it. But this is a $150 retail product. You see where the money went. I'm not saying they skimped on components, but it's a $150 game that reliably lasts in excess of 75 minutes, sometimes approaching two hours. And the quality of decision-making just doesn't live up to it. It can degenerate into a little bit of a mechanical slog. Weapon resolution, for example, although done relatively cleverly, takes a little too long for what it is. Everything has to join up in a queue. It's like, well, I'm at 874. Anyone above 874? Okay, well, then we move down to 650. Wait, no, I've got 724. It's like, okay, fine, you go now. As a result, you just spend a lot of time maneuvering around and manipulating these components and so you don't you don't get to emphasize the good decision making elements and you don't get a very fast satisfying experience yeah this is where i'm gonna bring back formula day and formula day is a racing game and it does what it does if you're looking for a giant robot smashing through you know a metropolitan city firing giant lasers and missiles and you know bunch of little mechs scurrying around their feet repairing them and and supporting them then i think i can't i struggle to think of another game that does it at all if not this well so for that it is what it you know it does what it sets out to do be it not well we didn't even talk about the achievement board that's on the side that seems completely arbitrary but i cannot recommend this game but like i said it does what it sets out to do i feel the final thing I'd like to, to point out is that the player counts are always going to be awkward. So this is a game in that goes from two to four players. You can play GKR with, with – actually, it goes from one to four. I tried the solo mode. The solo mode actually was half clever in terms of how it resolved things. Uh, I don't think it's worth it as a solo product, but I, I was reasonably pleased with, with how they handled movement and attack resolution there. So props in terms of the design on that. But if you're going to play it as a two-player game, it faces – so much stiff competition in terms of just a a one-on-one head-to-head battle type game for this amount of money even setting aside this amount of money but you can get a full set of battle lore which is going to give you lots more customization lots more quality of decision making in the same amount of time you get a full set of shade spire and you can play two two games of shade spire in the time that it takes you to play gkr heavy hitters Uh, or you could buy seven copies of sacker arms and uh i don't know 
play one of them and admire the other six stacked up on your shelf. Because Sakaar Arms, and I, I, I compare it for a reason, it has the same kind of idea of customizing different attack ranges and building a custom set of attacks, but it does it so much better in terms of the information presentation. It has much more nuance and surprise and much more tactical consideration in a much smaller, more compelling package. It's also the case, and this I think is my biggest mechanical gripe with the game. I'm not a huge fan of the one-shots. I'm not a huge fan of the uh, the customization or the achievement board either. But the biggest problem for me is turn order. And this is where the multiplayer game really suffers in GKR. Because every round there's going to be a start player and you move in turn order. And if you move before somebody, there is an excellent opportunity you will never be able to shoot them. Because there are, the, there are these very restrictive firing arcs. And without too much effort and without too much forethought, you can maneuver around to somebody's flank. And this gives you a bonus to attack. This also gives you an achievement. This also means that they will not be able to fire at you. And in a two-player game, it's acceptable, honestly, because you can game it. You can deliberately not tag buildings and not advance that victory condition, forego the sponsorship cards, and force the other person to go first. And that's fine. That's okay. That's a trade-off. I'm, I'm all right with that. But in a multiplayer game, especially if you're playing four players and it's a free-for-all and the person to your right is the start player, you are incredibly boned. If the person to your left is the start player, well then, congratulations, the world's your oyster. And just l- this level of arbitrariness and the fact that there's no mitigation for this and there's no control over who else takes the, the start player marker is borderline unforgivable. And again, in a game of this length, having all your turn frustrated because you have to move first and you're not able to get into a position to attack anybody is just not fun. I totally agree. There's not much more that I can add to that. Except, you know, they could have put in, you know, half damage if you're shooting something out of your arc, but this is a game where you can only fire in a certain arc, and if you move first, then you're sort of just putting yourself out there, and there's nothing you can do about it. Once you're out there, you have four other robots that are going to move, get in your flank, and you get to do nothing for your turn. And it's a bit unfortunate. I agree with you that in terms of this genre, it hasn't been done much. Monster Apocalypse, the old school Monster Apocalypse, did a very, very good job of having giant robots stomp around and destroy buildings. It was a very complicated game, though, and... It wasn't substantially longer than a game of GKR. It was it was it was just relatively inaccessible, both in terms of the fact that it was a, a randomized blind by format and it was just a slew of special abilities. I do miss Monster Apocalypse sometimes. I wish I was thinking about this. I was trying to think about whether or not there were any good multiplayer, non team based kind of whack you upside the head games. Now, there are, just to be clear, there are lots of dudes on a map games, and if you want to just fight generally, you know, then that, that's fine. But I'm thinking about something that, if it were a two-player game, would be a skirmish level mode, or if you just have one fighter and you're running around killing each other. Because sometimes I, I am inclined to do that. There was a game a few years ago called Yashima Legend of the Kami Masters, and I... I think it does a lot of what GKR does as well. You customize a deck, although you customize it a lot less in in Yashima. You have specific attack patterns and attack ranges, and you need to try to maneuver to make sure that they work properly. And there's a multiplayer mode there. And the way they handle multiplayer combat in Yashima, so a three- or four-player free-for-all, it's slightly better than some of its peers. It doesn't work quite well, but it's it's more or less the only other game that I can think of in this design space that takes the multiplayer problem seriously. Uh, So if any listeners have any multiplayer fighting games like this that you think deal with the multiplayer problem seriously in a good way, I'd like to hear it because I'd, I'd, I'd like to be able to find a game like that to have in my collection. Because although GKR comes close in a number of ways, it's just it's just off in a number of parameters so that I just can't quite get it into to recommendation status, which I find disappointing because there are a fair number of things about the game that I like. Well, there is King of Tokyo. They do it they do, do it in a way where only one person can be in the middle and therefore, you know, it sort of breaks it up back into this, you know, two-player thing that we were talking about earlier where it's just difficult to do these multiplayer conflict games like Axe and Allies and games like that. They just turn it into a two-player game and then, you know, they get kicked out of Tokyo and back and until someone else takes their place and then it becomes a two-player game with someone else. I wish there were a, a more robust version with combat, with the ability to pound on your friends in a free-for-all format that did things without degenerating. Maybe it's impossible. Maybe it's just that this kind of design space do, do, doesn't work. And I will say this, just as, a, as a, a final cap off for things that GKR does reasonably tolerably, it doesn't engage in too much kingmaking. The way the multiplayer rules work, although the turn order is just degenerate and awful, 
it is the case that the game ends once someone's eliminated, and then the winner is the person who's taken the least damage. So in theory, if you are not currently winning, you have an, it, you, it is in your interest not to end the game and pile on to somebody else. You need to make sure that the damage is distributed equally. This doesn't work as well as it should, though, because it becomes a little more cumbersome than you want to figure out how much damage people have. You have to ask people, and they have to count up the cards in the discard pile and count up the cards in the hand and the deck to let you know how many quote-unquote hit points they have left, which, again, is just slightly more cumbersome than a game like this wants to be. But at least it doesn't fall victim to that, but it does run headlong into a lot of the other multiplayer problems. So an unfortunate near miss, as far as I'm concerned. And that is Giant Killer Robots. All right, now on to our topic of the week, which is blinging out your games. So what what do you like how do you like to bling out your games, Mark? Well, we don't normally like to talk about religion on a podcast like this. We try to keep, you know, religion, sex and politics out of it, but I think it's worth acknowledging the great doctrinal theological matters of sleeving, of whether or not you're a card sleever. And uh, so let, let me just ask right out, Walker, um, if if this, unless you think that this is an inappropriate question, are you a member of the Church of Sleeves? Well, that always depends, Mark. I always I always have to play a game a few times. And if it, is, if it is a deck that is getting multiple shuffles and used by multiple players, then I will more than likely sleeve it. Yes. I've never taken communion at the Church of Sleeves. I recognize that it fulfills a very important role in people's lives. Uh, you know, I'm not particularly worried about the end of days coming and the Dragon Pro Ultra Shield descending from his heavenly mount and reducing to ash all the unsleeved cards so that the unbelievers can well and gnash their teeth. By the way, I make these jokes because I don't have any objection to people who sleeve cards that have become marked or sleeve cards that are now differentiable. But what I've encountered a number of times, particularly on Board Game Geek and elsewhere, is this, first of all, the fallacy that most gamers sleeve their games, which is completely false. It's demonstrably untrue, but a number of people in the Church of Sleeves seem to view it as a universal faith when it is not. It is not a Catholic church. And the second thing that people claim is that any, you know, you, you hear lots of overgeneralizations. Any deck builder needs to be sleeved 100%, or any game or anything needs to be shuffled needs to be sleeved, obviously. I've owned over a 1,000 games, some of those games I have played over a hundred times, and many of them are card games, and I've never had to sleeve anything ever at all, period. And I don't think I'm living in a del- del- delusional fantasy land where the cards are illegible, d- easily differentiable, and everyone's just playing the deck because they know what's coming up next or merely fused together through human grime. I've taken them to, to, to public game days. I've taken games to cons. I've had strangers and randos handle the cards. And yeah, sure. Once water got spilled on a game that I had, once, and then I replaced it. And for the cost of that replacement, I could have perhaps purchased, say, you know, five packs of high-quality sleeves. So I don't understand the people who go to the expense. I don't understand the people who go to the time. It's a time-consuming process. You know, the tithes are expensive. For the cost of sh- of sleeves, you can easily afford to replace any game that, that, that gets damaged. Now, if it's an old, out-of-print game and you're really, really worried about it getting damaged, fine, by all means. If you play with alcoholics on the regular basis or you only play in pubs, okay, that I can understand. But seriously, some of the dogmatic positions I hear that people take on sleeving just leaves me befuddled. I do not understand what they're what they're talking about. It's true. I, I I can see how they are helpful though. Like sometimes when a company puts out an expansion, the colors off or the size is off, or in role games you don't want you definitely want to make sure that the card's not marked so no one knows what the roles are. So I I can see their purpose, but I definitely do not sleeve everything. I'm wondering if it feeds into this. You can see on pictures where everyone has their, you know, game collection all laid out nice and pristine and straight on the shelves. And maybe it just all adds into this, you know, keeping everything in its place type thing. I'm wondering if that is what's going on here. Sure. But I go back to I have first edition, first printings of all the Race for the Galaxy expansions that I've played many, many, many times. Don't have any problem with the fact that none of them are sleeved. I have a first printing of Mage Knight. And all the expansions there. And so the card backs are different and the card texture is different. It's fine. They're, none of them are sleeved. There's clump, There's a little bit of clumping, sure. I'll acknowledge that clumping is an issue. Am I willing to pay 20 bucks for every card game I have to avoid clumping? No, definitely not. And it's also the case that 
let me also set aside, some people just prefer the tactile experience of playing with sleeved cards. I actually prefer the feel of unsleeved cards, but that's, that's fine. If it's just a, a preference, that's fine. The only reason why I make fun of sleevers is the ones who assert that it's a necessity when manifestly it is not. That, that, that's the only thing. But of course, in the great theology of sleevers, I'm what is known as an unrepentant naturalist. So, All right, that's enough about card sleeves. Let's move on to box inserts. And why it might be ne- not necessary, but why do people get box inserts? Why are they helpful? The reasons I I decide sometimes get boxes, it has to facilitate the setup and the put away of the game or make the flow of the game easier. If it somehow manages the components during the game to make the game flow easier, then I will get it. Otherwise, it's a hard pass. Unless it, like I have, I have the one game that I bling out no matter what, whether it's, you know, helpful or not. If you have that one game, that's fine. But to get box inserts for everything, I do not see the necessity. I agree that the bar... I, I have some custom inserts myself. But the bar is very, very, very high. Because most of the time, I'm perfectly happy with either plastic bags or in some rare, relatively rare instances, although more common with inserts, little Plano boxes or little uh, tackle boxes or what have you. And we'll talk about that in a moment, perhaps. But the, the one insert that you have that I don't quite understand is you have the custom insert for 51st State Master Set. Why do you, do you think that that was a good value for your money? And if so, why? I just think it keeps all the resources in one place. When you pull it out, you can hand, you know, the, the groups of players their resources. The decks are all nicely, you know, you're not in bags. You don't have to worry about playing them. You shuffle them together and you're ready to go. It's that easy. And it, and it manages them during the game instead of, you know, throwing them, you know, into piles or all over the board. You just throw them back in their slots and everything keeps nice and tidy throughout the game. And then when you go to put it away, you just grab them, put them back in the box, and you're done. Well, first of all, the cost of the insert is roughly the cost of the game, which strikes me as strange in and of itself. I would much rather have, although this is a personal preference as a game collector, I would much rather have two games rather than one game of 51st State with a custom insert or even just save the money and say, you know, treat myself to a nice meal or two. But I don't find – we're not talking about a particularly component-intensive game. The, the insert isn't going to shuffle the cards for you. The insert is just going to manage the different tokens, and there's not that many different kinds of tokens. What's wrong with just leaving them in baggies? Well, this is the difference between – you and I, Mark, you, when you play games, you like to leave all the components in the bags and take half an hour to go pick up the bag, slowly pull the piece out while, while you're fishing around inside the bag trying wow. to get the one that you're looking for, you know, while you're keeping four other people waiting. And then, oh, you finally found it and then you pull it out and then you put the bag way over there and that That's takes another ridiculous. five minutes. Where I am a dumper. I, at the beginning of the game, I like to dump all the components out into piles and so they're easily grabbed and then... That's me. No, no, no. You're a human dumpster fire. There's a difference. That's, this is probably true. So th- I do have a couple of games where I bought the custom insert. One of them is Feast for Odin. I got the Meeple Realty custom insert there. Part of it was – a very small part of it was the aesthetics. They have lovely laser etching everywhere. But a lot of uh, companies do that now. And it's very impressive on it from an engineering level what they're able to pull off. But it had very cool and functional axe pieces that separate out the bank – uh, the bank coins. And I will grant you, not being a dumper, that it it is a little troublesome making change with all the tiny little coin tokens in Feast for Odin unless you have an organizer to sort it all. I probably could have gotten by with a little uh, plastic bin, but I like the little axes and there are two of them so you get to put one across the table. Uh, so I don't really regret that. It also is a, a boat for the moose. How could you not want a boat for your moose? If you have a moose without a boat, I think that's animal abuse. I think it's very lonely, a very lonely moose. I also have the, uh, the the broken token insert for Blood Rage. And the only reason why I got that, this was almost purely aesthetics, was because I was tired of all my figures being bent. And if I just dumped them in baggies and in, into a box, they would just get bent again. And we're talking about a game with lots of spears and lots of swords and lots of axes and things get, uh, things getting basically sagging and, and succumbing to pressure, uh, very much like your face. And I was, because I got the insert, I was able to just give them all the boiled water treatment, get them straight the way I want them, and now I know that they're not going to get bent again. But honestly, Blood Rage is a game that I've made very clear that I really, really like and will play uh, fairly regularly in the years going forward. And the components are sufficiently nice that I wanted to protect them. I certainly wouldn't do that for anything. It's true. And then there's the inserts that replace the game components, much like the Terraforming Mars one, where the game components were sinful to say the least 
So what they've done is... See, this is the moralistic language you can expect from an adherent to the Church of Sleeves. That's, That's so true. It replaces your player board where, you know, it was glossy and the cube slid everywhere and you never knew exactly what you had. And the, there was m- multiple, like, you can say it's not a problem, but when there's over half a dozen different companies that have put out replacement parts for this particular aspect of the game, you cannot deny that there is a problem. So what this one does is give you all new player boards so the cubes lock in and it looks great, organizes the game. So that's one for Terraform Mars. It's another one I picked up. I thought they did a great job on that. Some of them, I don't want to slam any particular companies, don't make any sense to me from a functional perspective. Anytime, I, I find it very easy to pass on these custom inserts because my basic standard is if there's any functional impairment to this over just plastic bags, and then I'm gonna then it's an easy hard pass. So Every time I look at a game that I quite enjoy, for which I have lots of expansions, this is organized everything, usually it's something like it requires multiple boxes or it doesn't hold all the expansions. It was released before the last wave of expansions, so it doesn't hold everything. Or it even does something simple like in order to give everyone their player material, you have to find the player material in three different boxes. And as somebody who just uses Ziplocs and tosses everything into a bag after chucking the useless cardboard insert... I really like the ability to say, oh, you're playing purple here and just toss them a Ziploc bag full of all the purple stuff rather than being like, okay, well, here's your thing from here and here's your thing from here and here's your thing from here. I just don't I, – I can't be bothered. So true. So that is box inserts. Do you have anything else for box inserts? I'm done box inserts. Well, we can talk a little bit about foam core. Some of the some of the things that people do with foam core is, is truly spectacular. I do not have any enthusiasm for arts and crafts. It fills me with shame, dread, and pain. I was that kid in kindergarten who didn't want to do it, and I have these uh, useless sausage fingers. Uh, so anything remotely crafty, I'm not able to do. Even putting together the custom inserts that they laser etch for you very carefully, I find somewhat difficult. But I did have someone very kindly made me a custom foam core insert for Mage Knight. There was really impressive design on Board Game Geek that gave every player these beautiful little boxes that separate up the cards and the tokens and everything, and you just hand them this lovely little compartment. And that's to say nothing of the general uh, components in Mage Knight. There's, you know, half a dozen different enemy types that all need to be separated out, and half a dozen different decks that need to be separated out, et cetera, et cetera. Some games really do need very careful organizational schema, and sometimes an insert's the best way to do that. And some of the foam core stuff that I've seen on Board Game Geek blows me away. Now, by the same token, some of the foam core stuff on Board Game strikes me as grotesquely unnecessary and wasteful, just in terms of time and, and resources involved. Some people seem to make a foam core insert for every game they have, when I often find it completely unnecessary. But there's a lot of impressive stuff out there. Yeah, I'm glad you went back, because like, I'm the opposite. I really enjoy putting these inserts together, and I think the engineering that goes into making all of this fit into the box is quite spectacular. Oh, great. You can build some for me, then. No problem at all. So on to upgrading components in this Kickstarter world. A lot of the times uh, the stretch goals upgrade your components, but there are several, you know, third-party companies that you can order upgraded components like Special Meeples or Resources. Stonemeyer's has a great set of Food Crate Energy Box and Resource Vault. Meeple Realty has all sorts of different meeples you can get to bling out your games. Have you bought any of these, Merc? Or coins. There's all sorts of different coins you can get too. I'm not, I don't object to metal coins or plastic coins. I've never purchased any myself. I know lots of people buy poker chips for any game with lots of uh, financial transactions. I've never done that myself either, although I can recognize the utility of that. I don't object to paper money and I don't object to cardboard money tokens, although maybe I should. I almost never pay for component upgrades on things like Kickstarter campaigns, uh, usually, again, because of the expense. And often, sometimes, I do regard that there's a mild decrease in usability. My standard is always the same. If there's the slightest decrease in utility, I can make it an easy pass and save the money. An example of this is Scythe. I know you've blinged out Scythe to the nth degree. Pretty much everything there is for Scythe you have. And I found it an I found it easy to pass on the upgraded resources simply because, and th- maybe this is just a, a, a sort of principle of thrift, an excuse to save money, but it made the color matching less good. The resources color match in Scythe. Everything matches either, you know, the, the, the icon on the terrain, the icon on your board, the color of the resource itself. But in uh, the upgraded resources, the food tokens don't match as well, and some of the other tokens don't match as well in terms of color. So I use that as my excuse for not doing that. Fair enough. I do like blinging out things with toys, though, when, when, if it's a game that I really, really, really like. An example of this, and I talked about this before last week, my copy of Warfighter doesn't have the honestly chintzy little plastic minis that the game comes with, but instead I have these mega blocks 
borderline action figures, and I'm able to equip them WYSIWYG, and so it helps with the utility of the game. It's like, oh, wait, which one's my sniper? That one's my sniper, the one holding the sniper rifle. And it's 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 fun. I like to play with toys while I'm playing with my games. I'm just a, a, a kid at heart. I've got flags for playing Imperial 2030. They were a gift from the designer when he sent me the, my, uh, my playtest copy, so that's great. I've got these, instead of little cardboard tokens that identify you as having the controlling share in, say, Brazil or India, I instead have these about 12-inch long plastic fans that you get to wave around, uh, which I quite enjoyed. And uh, so in, in, in some instances, if it increases the functionality and it's cool and I like to physically manipulate it, I'll go for it. But most of the time, I find these little resource upgrade packs to be more money than they're worth. Yeah, I agree. I, I enjoy putting all sorts of stuff in my games like that. Like uh, Robo Rally, I built flags for all the points. And we both did the thing for Kemet where we took slides, you know, where you have slides up on the wall. You take slide sheets and you put all the abilities in them. So you just pull them out of the box, lay them on the table. They're all ready to go. That we probably should have talked about in the context of inserts and organizational schemes because, yeah, honestly, I think that might have actually been the first time I ever tracked down a storage solution for a game and paid money for it, even before I'd even bought any of my own uh, Plano or, or tackle box organizers because the power tiles in Kemet are a pain to set up if they're just stacked in a, a, a pile or, or in a baggie. But we both have slide sheets where we just slide them into a binder sheet and so when it comes to setup, we just take this, literally, this sheet of, of plastic mylar and put it on the table, and that's all the, the tiles set up. It's done, yet. Yeah. And then, like I said, Dinosaur Island, I played it. I saw their first player token. I've, I've replaced many first player tokens in a lot of games because they're mostly, you know, an afterthought or, wh- or whatever from the, the producer. And so in the Dinosaur Island, this is while I was playing the game, I just pulled up my phone, looked up, you know, insects trapped in amber, and they're like $3 you can order on the internet, and done. And now I'm going to have this great, you know, first player token for Dinosaur Island. And I think actually the first player marker that comes in the box is just a cardboard token representing an insect trapped in amber. Exactly, so yeah. That, that is a good literal upgrade. I remember once, uh, that, that reminds me of somebody in, at, at a con once I played Combat Commander with, and in Combat Commander, the initiative card, which passes back and forth, is a card that shows a grenade. He used a plastic grenade, which admittedly sometimes felt a bit risky, but <laughs> passing that thing back and forth. There's also a lot of uh, miscellaneous hacks that, that I've sought out to improve usability. There are these great Gloomhaven bases that I got as a birthday present that hold the status markers and hit point dice to track uh, a monster so you no longer when playing Gloomhaven and say, okay, that's skeleton number two. Look over at the sheet, see what skeleton number two is. So you just look over, oh, I see that it's stunned and it has two hit points left. Okay, great. Uh, mostly this is so that the people I'm playing with don't constantly ask me for the stats of monsters when they can bloody well see it themselves. Yeah, these selfish people that eat up your time. I don't know why, you, I don't know why you play with the Merc. Jerks. There's also uh, a timer that I played with that a friend of mine back in Massachusetts had, which is called the DGT Cube, which is just a cube with six different colored faces and six different LCD readouts on them. And if it's yellow's turn, you just put the cube in front of them with yellow facing up, and it starts ticking up how much time yellow is taking. And then when it's red's turn, you yellow it takes the cube, turns it so that red is facing up, and puts it in front of them. It's a it's a very cool device. A little more expensive. It's always been about 50 bucks whenever I've seen it for sale. Uh, I wish I could get it for cheaper because I do like playing games with timers just so that people are conscious of how much time they're taking up. It really does uh, speed things up sometimes. So when some of our uh, <clears throat> slower acquaintances are at the table, we might want to consider bringing that out. That just reminded me of taking parts from other games and adding them to... So we there's another game called Snow Tales, and they have this paw marker that you're supposed to put it in front of the player that you think is taking too long. And I just keep that separate out on the shelf. And, and when I think it's necessary, I just have it on the table and I use it for any game. It's the big pause marker. Yes. It's, it's brilliant. I and love it. I love it when game designers bling out their own games for nothing. It's like, oh, we have room on a counter sheet. Let's see if we can do something cool with this. Yeah, Always a big fan. And it's hilarious. Sometimes people don't even know what it is, right? I just go downstairs, you know, grab some other components and... And I put it in front of them. They go, oh, what's that? Oh, that's just a marker for people who are taking too long. Yeah. Or there's those, I didn't talk about the the movement trays for uh, all those hex games. There's Twilight Imperium. There's Rune Wars. A great company put out these, uh, like, uh, three-dimensional hexes on stands so you can put all your troops on it and move them around as, as armies. I thought they were great as well. Yeah, I, I have those for Eclipse, actually. Nice. And the last thing I want to talk about is... Doing away with your box completely. I have a few games where I've just ditched the box completely, namely Battle Lore and Imperial Assault. 
I've just put everything in those giant Plano boxes, you know, the trays pull out, they have the armies, they have places for all the tokens and the boards, and everything seems to work out just fine, and it's much more handy. I've never had the courage to do that. I remember, I still remember how liberating it was to finally join the ranks of people who routinely throw out inserts uh, of the boxes. Now, some some game inserts are great, and I keep those, absolutely, and I, I use them. Sometimes I even keep them uh, past their point of utility. Like, the Dogs of War insert is barely functional, but it, it, it's very nicely done, and it's molded well, so I keep it around. But most of the time, I ditch them, especially the cardboard ones. I, I, I tend to trash them at the earliest available opportunity. But I haven't quite reached the level where I've been willing to get rid of a game box entirely. I probably should. I probably, it would probably be more sane for me in some cases, like those games with sprawling numbers of expansions, to just get rid of it all. But I can't, I, I. It's 99.9% of the time, that's what goes. I take the, the shrink wrap off, open the box and throw the insert over my shoulder, which is funny. Cause now that I think of it, I think the Twilight Imperium 4 insert, I, for whatever reason I kept, I think it's just in the back of my mind because it's the very first fantasy flight custom insert that they've ever done so maybe that's the reason why i haven't thrown it out yet because it is it does not work either <laughs> but uh there are a few like uh, quadropolis their insert is fantastic but of course now there's because it's the same thing we talked about before with the 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 wooden custom inserts as soon as an expansion comes out guess what it's no good anymore and it's the same for the insert that comes with the game if they ever have an expansion then so i haven't picked up the expansion for quadropolis yet but once i get it now this fantastic insert that's in the game what am i going to do days of wonder tends to put out really good inserts as a rule most companies don't take it very seriously but some that do like days of wonder they tend to put out good stuff on the topic though of just fitting everything back i tend to have a very i'm very loath to pick up add-ons or blinged out stuff that will not fit into the box at all and the the, the biggest example to me of this is playmats a lot of people love having those playmats and being able to roll out a larger version or a more tactilely satisfying version that lays flat Uh, i often just can't bring myself to do it because it's not going to fit back in the box and going from taking one thing because we often travel with our games we go to game nights we go to cons we go to other people's houses and things like that the difference between taking one box for each game and like one and a half boxes or two boxes in a rolled up thing, it's huge. And so I just can't be bothered. It's true. This really breaks my, my head sometimes because for whatever reason, I am a fan of these play mats, but I, I really loathe expansion boxes. Like I cram everything into the main box to the point where if the lid's a bit up, whatever, because I am not having games that take up two boxes. It is just against, but for whatever reason, I really don't have, I have a problem, you know, with lugging these play mats around, but it doesn't, you know, crack into my OCD like the rest of it does for whatever reason. A lot of this is just really personal. The things you're willing to put up with, the things you're not willing to put up with. Yeah, just games you really like. Like even if other people don't like it, then, you know, you really like it, you want to bling it out. That leads me to the other point I wanted to talk about was in this cult of the new thing that we're in, I just find it odd that, you know, we're blinging, maybe it's in this bubble that we're in. Maybe we're in our group, we're playing new games all the time, but I, I don't think it's just our bubble. I think in this, because the industry, you know, over 800 games are coming out every year. So we're constantly playing new games, yet there's this huge market that's that's come up of, you know, improving or spending money on one particular game that, you know, in this cult of the new that will not get played because we're all playing new games now. So I, I, it's very questionable to me. It might just be the twisted corollary of the market logic. I mean, there are all these man children that are willing to spend $100 on a product that they play once or twice. So I guess the market logic is, and it certainly seems to be borne out, well, I guess these man children would be willing to pay $200 for a product that they're only willing to play once or twice. That's one of the reasons why I find a lot of people's predisposition towards things like custom inserts a bit baffling. I'll see if I like the game first before I start playing it out. Some people just seem to, at the moment they order the game, they'll order the game, all the available expansions, a whole bunch of sleeves to put them in, maybe the custom insert right away, or they'll immediately start, you know. It, it's the same logic that leads people to print out player aids before they've played the game for the first time, or even before they've read the rules. You need to know what you need to know in order to get, in order to approach these things, otherwise you're just going to be bloating it with more cruft. Same thing with inserts. You have to have played the game a number of times to know how to organize things properly for setup and teardown. When I buy a game, take the shrink wrap off, I don't really try to organize everything. Sometimes it comes with bags, sometimes it doesn't. I usually just throw all the tokens into one bag until I played it, right? There's, I, you know what I mean? Same thing, or 
buy an insert or buy in sleeves or whether I sleeve it or not, I have to play it a bunch of times to see how much these components are being used or how long it takes to set up or how long it takes to put away. And will these things actually, you know, help? In fairness, I, I could easily imagine somebody appreciating an unnecessary insert in very much the same way that I appreciate having games that I probably will never play. I mean, at the end of the day, it's still just an expensive luxury that's not going to actually see any any utility. I like having, you know, a box full of components and a rule book. I could, I could easily imagine someone appreciating having the laser-etched MDF balsa wood construction uh, and appreciating that on the same level. So I guess I shouldn't be too dismissive. I should probably make I should probably have that as a bumper sticker. I probably shouldn't be too dismissive. I'll forget it though. Oh, more than likely. I'll 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 I'm sure I'll be dismissive very quickly. Actually, that was me being dismissive of myself. So there you go. Yeah, you've broken the rule already. All right, so Ouroboros is eating its own tail. So I guess that wraps it up for this episode of So Very Wrong About Games. Thank you very very much for joining us. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter at all the games you like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if you can. Just a small reminder that in five weeks' time, on episode 25, we'll be giving away a full Kickstarter pledge of Massive Darkness, because we love you so much and we hate ourselves. Thanks very much again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. Yeah, and remember from the beginning, have less arguments, more discussions, never tell anyone that their opinion is wrong, because that's our job. See you later. You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time. And always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>